good afternoon. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's talk by Professor Shonjai uh, Chakraborty. Uh, Professor Chakraborty is the Professor of Geography <coughs> and Urban Studies at the Temple University uh, in, in Philadelphia, and he's also a visiting fellow at the Center for Advanced Study of Indi India at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, his recent books include The Other One Percent, Indians in America, which was published in 2016, and is a collaborative work with others, including Devesh Kapoor, and there's a third, Nirvikar Singh. And Nirvikar Singh. Uh, the Promoter, which is incidentally a book of fiction, it's a novel, which was published in 2015, and the very well-known The Price of Land, Acquisition, Conflict, and Consequences, which was published in 2013. Uh, his fourth punk I mean, books include uh, The Truth About Us, Information and Society from Manu to Modi, Modi uh, which is a book on which the, uh, the current talk will be based on. The book, I believe, is in the production process and should be out uh, the middle of next year. Early next year. Early next year, probably around the time of the Indian elections. Um, his talk will, of course, cover a very long period uh, since Manuspriti, uh, which the sort of mythical figure of Manu had written, uh, is traced back roughly to the second century of the Christian era, right? 100 CE. Or maybe the, the dating Depending varies. On which of the 50 versions you believe. Right. Uh, but what we know for certain is that the book was uh, translated in English by Sir William Jones, he of the Asiatic Society fame in, I think, the early 1790s. And it was, you know, it formed the, the foundation of the so called Hindu law, uh, which was applied in colonial India. So, in that sense, it got a second life. Under, under the British. Um, uh, so, of course, the, mon uh, the Manu in the title is the Manu who had, you know, the professed author of Manusriti, and the Modi is Narendra Modi and not Nirav Modi, I assume. <laughs> and um, there are some tough words like epistemology in the, in the abstract, which uh, Shanjoy, I'm sure, will, will enlighten us about. And besides talking about you know, Manu and Modi, of course, I think he'll talk about many things in between. So over to you, Sanjay, around uh, 40 minutes or so, 40 to 45 minutes. Sounds perfect. Yeah. Q yep. Well, thank you, Ranu Jai. Um, thank you, everyone, um, for coming and, and letting me speak, uh, particularly Omidendu, uh, who's my partner in crime in another project we're doing together. Um, and you know, to ISAS, of course, which has uh, you know been hosting me for a good three, four years now. Uh, so it's it's nice to be back, and it's nice to see some familiar and unfamiliar faces around the room. Um, as Ronjoy uh, told you, um, this uh, what I'm going to talk about today uh, is uh, a small portion of a book that's coming out shortly. <coughs> it is. Um, This talk is going to be hard for me to do. Um, I'll tell you frankly, because this is the first talk I'm giving on this book. Uh, I normally give the talks after the, the stuff is out. Um, and uh, there is a lot in the book. And um, I promised Rona Joy that I'll tell one of the things that are in the book. Because I really believe, and I will actually, in the talk, tell you why I believe uh, we should keep things simple. Whether I succeed or not is another matter altogether uh, that you shall tell me shortly. Um, so that said, um, let's uh, begin with some uh, words of wisdom uh, from uh, people who came before us. Um, uh, at, at, you know, when I was talking with a few um, colleagues of mine earlier, they said, you're very brave to use the word truth. Uh, academics don't do that. Is this, yeah, we, then we leave it to somebody else to, you know, usurp that term. So um, here's Oscar Wilde who said, the truth is rarely pure and never simple. Um, Friedrich Nietzsche who said, there are no facts, only interpretations. Uh, and history is a set of lies agreed upon, which is um, actually um, uh, uh, ascribed to any number of uh, 
possible speakers, including Napoleon and Voltaire. We don't know who actually said this, or if anybody ever did. Um, and we come to um, some new words from, from the information age. Right? Um, these are all award-winning words. Um, truthiness, um, the quality of seeming to be true according to one's intuition, opinion, or perception without regard to logic, factual evidence, or the like. Uh, this word was coined by one of my uh, favorite comedians, a guy called Stephen Colbert. I don't know how many of you follow him. Um, he's a pretty astute uh, observer of life in general. Um, uh, Post-truth, uh, relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion, etc. And of course, um, the current winner is, is fake news. Um, false of insensational information, disseminated under the guise of news reporting. Um, we in India, of course, have paid news. We have advertorials. We have um, different other versions of, of, of fake news. And, and they've been around before fake news was around. Um, the reason I begin with these two sets of quotes um, is uh, to partly suggest that uh, not a lot is new under the sun. I, I think um, Mr. Wilde, Mr. Nietzsche, and Napoleon, uh, and so on, were saying basically um, what we are saying now, um, except we think we are saying something new. Um, and um, what has probably changed is the volume and velocity of information production, right? And I begin here, there are many points I could have begun at. I, I begin at this point, not because um, uh, it's a particularly uh, wonderful leading to uh, my broader thesis, uh, which is uh, serious um, and which um, needed some leavening before being put on the table. It's, I'm um, trying to get a handle on what I consider to be India's existential questions right now. Um, it, that might sound like a very tall claim, and, and I hope you'll point out exactly why it is a very tall claim. Um, I believe um, the existential questions are about the identity of the Indian collective. Who are we as a people? Um, are we a pluralistic, heterogeneous society, or are we a homogeneous Hindu society? This is a public battle being fought in media, on the streets. <coughs> through politics and other means. However, this is not a new question. This is an old question. This has been around pretty much from the time that the British began organizing our information system into the categories and subjects and streams that we take for granted now as if they are age old. Um, much of Indian public discourse um, has in the past been connected to print, right? The print nationalism, the, the print media was fundamentally and essentially the motivating factor that almost created the nation, right? Um, on the one hand, there was the map the, of the colonizer, the, 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 the British that created the nation, but that did not create the nation. It created an administrative territory. What created the nation was print media and the organization of a collective identity that everybody from uh, Tilak to Gandhi to Bose to uh, the original propagators of, of Hindutva uh, version 1.0, they, they all worked through print media. So this question of what the identity of the collective is has been around as long as print has been available in India, as long as newspapers have been printed in India, which is roughly from the 1830s. The other big question, I believe, is, is uh, what is the trajectory of justice in India? Um, how big are the gaps in opportunity and achievement between India's different social groups? Um, between in the citizenry and uh, in, in general. Um, 
Have they these gaps? Uh, how big are these gaps? Have these gaps been growing in in recent years, or have they been declining in recent years? This question is relatively new, at least in the form that we are beginning to address this question, um, and has probably become really important in the last three decades. But as I, I shall argue at the end that um, the, the, the real problems with how we deal with this question. I will, by and large, um, not go into a, a detail of, of a lot of these things. I will return to, to, to these two broad overarching questions at the end. What I want to take you through first is a little bit of theory. In, in order to understand how collective identities are formed, um, how we know who we are, whoever the we is, who is included in that group. Mm -hmm. However an individual figures out his or her own identity, if the collective uh, he or she uh, belongs to by birth or by choice, um, it is necessary for us to begin from um, a fundamental fundamentals uh, where we have not gone so far. I believe we have not. And I believe it is necessary for us to understand the politics of information. Now, what do I mean by the politics of information? Um, it is the choices that are made on these very crucial questions on what is considered information and what is not. Um, I'll, I'll come to, to this point later on. Choices made on categorization, with this turns out to be the really, really big one, is, is what um, group is one assigned to, or what group does one choose to align oneself with. These groups must exist. You, 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 it's very hard for most people to actually create one's own group and say, I am a group of one. Counting, of course, uh, uh, the, the uh, only way you add statistical content to, to a category uh, or to a group or to an identity is by counting how many people there are in it. And what is counted and what is not and what is measured and what is not and how things are measured, of course, is its own science of epistemology is part of it. And of course, communication. How is this information communicated to um, the public at large, right? So this, this to me, is, is the core of the politics of information. There are two important variables over here. One is um, who has power over information? How much power um, does that person have? Uh, what does that person already know or believe? What is inside that person's head? And what is that person's interest? If, if this seems abstruse, I by and by I hope to be getting to firmer ground. But but if you think in in terms of uh, examples um, of, of what is considered information um, in um, India, for instance, um, one's caste identity is considered information. Um, in Africa, it is not. Uh, in the rest of the world, it is not. Um, it, which is not to say Indians in Africa do not have caste or do have caste. Whether they do or not does not matter because it is not considered information, nobody is counting, nobody is categorizing. Who makes the choice whether to count the caste of Indians in South Africa? Having made the choice, why would he choose to to count or not count a person's caste in South Africa. Having made the choice, is that person able to actually impl implement the choice that I, henceforth, the, the head of the apartheid government, will now count the caste of Indians in South Africa? Um, can I make it stick? And why would I do that? Why would I actually count the caste of Indians in South Africa? Th this is just, just for example. These questions can be asked of, of, of any power situation over information. And of course, the other big variable is the available information technology, right? 
what is information really matters on what is the level of information technology that is available. Right? So when the, when the British set about creating the Indian information system, which I shall show in just a moment, the only information available was in the form of scrolls. Right? It's Sanskrit, Sanskrit scrolls, or the only information that they considered to be information was available in the form of Sanskrit scrolls. From scrolls, we've gone through printing, and now we are into smartphones. As you can very quickly imagine, what is information, how it can be propagated, how it can be spread, how it can be counted, how it can be measured, really changes very, very dramatically based on the level of technology that's available. That's one argument. That's your basis that <coughs> information is not neutral, it's political. And a lot depends on who is creating, producing, counting, categorizing. And one needs to know that person's ideology, interest, and also what the technology is available that would allow one to count, categorize, create information. The second argument, and um, the first argument I don't think is particularly original. Um, I, I think a lot of people uh, would at least instinctively you know, nod their heads to it. Um, the second argument I believe is an original argument um, is uh, I'm arguing for what I'm calling the principle of sil simple information. And for this I'm relying on a, on a fair bit of work that's appearing out of uh, behavioral psychology. Um, some of it is uh, now has spread into behavioral economics. Um, and the, um, um, the guidebook I follow is actually one I've seen spread around um, this floor. People have this in their rooms. Uh, somebody's been giving this book out, I think. This is Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, right? Uh, Daniel Kahneman is, is, um, is, is a psychologist, um, and uh, his work is very, very important. Um, and one of the things he says, and uh, this is where he begins the book, the first half of the book is more or less devoted to this idea that th the brain has two kinds of systems at work at any given time, the system one and system two. <coughs> the thinking fast and slow. The thinking fast is the always operative part of, of the brain, right? This deals with uh, intuition, instant categorization, non-thinking behavior, um, almost instinctive behavior. And the more deliberative part of the brain, the thinking part of the brain, the, the slow part of the brain, um, is, is one um, that uh, if it is engaged, it prefers not to be engaged most of the time. He, he calls uh, our, our brains lazy. Uh, it, it, it does not wish to engage system two. If it, if it can get away with not engaging system two, it won't. If you, if you know the answer, if I look at a person, <coughs> and I'm looking at you, Rani, and just by looking at you, if I can stereotype 15 facts about you, I don't need to look at your CV to find out who you are, right? So as long as my stereotypes and instant information systems tell me enough, give me enough information, my other part of, the other part of my brain, the lazy part, doesn't engage. And th that's a good thing. There's a lo significant body of thought that argues that uh, almost the, the most vital aspect of human evolution has been this ability to categorize the ability to systematize data, to separate noise and signal, to quickly make decisions on what is dangerous, what is edible, who's a friend, who's an enemy. Um, and there are you know, psychologists and, 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 and uh, neuroscientists who are arguing that this is, this is a vital part of our, our, our uh, evolution as a species. Yet, and this, the, herein comes a conundrum, Yet it leads to the stereotypes and the prejudices, the normal everyday biases that affect our behavior, right? The, the same good evolutionary thing, when it applies to the non-human world, yields good outcomes. Apply, when it's applied to the human world, yields, well, not so good outcomes. The brain seeks 
cognitive ease, the lazy brain does not want to work. It avoids cognitive dissonance. It does not want to get information it is not familiar with or that conflicts with information that is already in the brain. It has a tendency to believe perseverance. Once you believe something, you tend to believe it. <coughs> and a ten tendency to selective recall. You remember stuff that's useful for you, that supports your position, that confirms what you already know, what you already think. You do not recall stuff. You do not wish to understand stuff that is in conflict, that is in dissonance to what you um, already know or think. And all of this leads to confirmation bias. Right? This is a term you guys are familiar with. We are very all, all guilty of confirmation bias. You can call it a prejudice. You can call it a bias. You can call it an ideology. You can call it a theory. You can call it whatever you wish. All of us are prey to confirmation bias. <coughs> which leads to my point about the principle of sim simple information, which is that complex information must be reduced to its simplest forms for it to provide cognitive utility. Corollary one, the more complex the information, the greater the need or demand for simple information. Just as an example, what is the explanation for the higher family size of Muslims in India? In this room, I'm sure there's a good kind of model based explanation for it, which has a lot to do with poverty, um, which has something to do with the region of location. Uh, but in most of India, the answer is because they wish to overtake the Hindu population. Right? Th that is your, um, the, the, the stereotype, the, the, the knee jerk, the, the quick answer that you quick, that fits into your framework, your ideology, your worldview. You don't have to think further. Corollary two, the greater the quantity of information, the greater the need or demand for simple information. The more stuff there is, the more simplification we need. Right? The best example are our web search engines. You know, if you type in my name, you get thousands of records. Right? You type in most of our names, you'll get thousands of records. Well, thanks to Google, they, they've rank ordered it, and there's a, you know, this is the first page, here's your second page. Um, and b nobody, reached, I have not ever Googled myself and reached page number 1,000. It's just too far to go, right? Um, and the corollary three, which is the one that I think applies to us more and more in the, in the current moment, is that the greater the number of sources of information, the less relevant or credible they all are. When we were growing up, in fact, after I grew up, there was Doordarshan. I think this is true of quite a few people in this room. After we grew up, there was Doordarshan. Now there are 900 TV channels in India. There are 400 news channels in India. You can choose your news. News is not neutral. News is a product. Right? It's like potatoes or cards. You can choose. Just like you can choose the car you wish to buy, given your budget, you can choose the news you wish to consume. I do that. I think all of us do that. None of us actually consumes news in a neutral fashion, going to channel after channel, looking at, OK, how are they treating this particular story? Simplifying complexity is, 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 is a big deal. right? All of us do that. Right? We. Um, we do the first order simplifications, right? This is the expert discourse. We create models, we create codes, symbols, arcane knowledge, jargon, equations, laws, theorems. These are all, all simplifications, right? But it's, these are simplifications that we use to communicate with each other. We cannot all always start from the first principle. Unless we have these equations, theorems, formulas, and so on, it's hard to communicate with each other. The second order simplification is where politics comes in. Right? There is politics in the first order simplification. The second order is what politicians do, teachers do, journalists do, which is the communication to lay persons. And here happens an interesting thing, which is that the acceptability of information depends on the provider of the information. 
Whom do you trust? Whom do you read? Whom do you cite? We have the same you know, politics of um, um, authenticity. You know? oh, when we mention such and such a person, oh, he's at Harvard. Oh, no, she's at Princeton. They're in the being at the Harvard, the Princeton comes with a certificate of authenticity, a certificate of trustworthiness, right? So information exists in both forms, in forms of models, theorems, um, abstractions, theories, and so on, and in the forms of labels, stereotypes, stories, and traditions. How are we doing on time? might need to speed up just a yeah. little bit. Um. Now Manu. Simplification in the age of scrolls. A good fraction of the book is devoted to what I have placed in a one PowerPoint page over here because this is a matter of establishing what can be a pretty controversial argument. Um, that can get people into trouble in India today. Uh, I have argued that the colonizers created Hinduism by aggregating the non-Muslims. Um, uh, the word Hindu, of course, as you probably know, uh, does not exist in any known Sanskrit text. Um, it is very hard for people to imagine, for me to imagine, that um, uh, anything can have um, existence without being named um, in order for um, any group idea uh, or anything to exist it first must be named without a name it is not recognizable if the name Hindu did not exist then the group Hindu did not exist there, there are many other this is a very elaborate argument there's, there's, a, there's a lot that I could say but I'm not going to say it today as uh, Ranujai uh, pointed out at the very beginning, uh, they created a common law for Hindus by canonizing the Manusmriti. Um, translated, as you pointed out, by William Jones. Sir William Jones uh, in the year 1794, um, the very year that he died, actually. Um, uh, the Manusmriti he happened to translate uh, was one that has come to be called the Kuluka Bhatta version. Um, that was actually probably plagiarized from what is called the Govinda Raja version. Um, the Govinda Raja version is from the 11th century. The Kuluka Bhatta version is from the 15th century. These are not from antiquity. Um, it, it is um, believed at this point that the Manusmriti was not the source of law anywhere in India. I think one can draw a skeptical kind of general consensus that Manusruti is in many ways is a fantasy, is a Brahman fantasy of how they would like the world to be. Um, the world in which, you know, people below them, they, they would describe these are people below us. All people are below us. And all these people, their existence uh, is defined by their relationship to us. Um, therefore, what they do, what they eat, how they behave, where they walk, whom they marry, what they eat, all of that is in relation to what I wish, what pleases me, and in relation to us. Well, uh, the, the world did not quite work in that way. Um, and it, it is best, perhaps, to treat this as, as a, a fantasy that circulated for a while not very widely. Um, but nonetheless, um, uh, it was made into, at least initially, um, the source of Hindu law. The colonizers also eventually established the hierarchical caste system, primarily through the census. Um, they began with uh, an intent to um, establish the Chaturvarna caste system, uh, which is the, the hierarchy of uh, Brahman, Kshatriya, then, you know, some version of Vaishya, um, Shudra, um, and then ran into enormous practical problems because nowhere in India, and I mean nowhere in India, did this particular Chaturvarna system exist. So from the field came er 
you know, urgent plea after urgent plea, please let us do something else because this doesn't work. Um, people did something else. They created enormous cost lists. The, uh, the largest cost list that the British did had about 4,100 costs in it. Um, they did try to stick to the Chaturvana system as long as possible. Um, but they continued to create a hierarchy. This lasted well into the late 19th century. Um, the hierarchy can be seen. Um, so for instance, in, in um, the, the Northeast province, the very first census of 1872, there was a fourfold caste system in the, in the Northeast provinces. In the same census, in Southern India, there were uh, 13 castes. Um, they, they could not stick to four r r right, right over there. <coughs> uh, the religion categories uh, were also uh, established through the census, through the act of counting, uh, categorizing and counting. Uh, Sikhs, for instance, were not a religion in the first um, census, uh, but by organizing had become a religion by the second uh, census. Um, uh, Jains uh, became a religion because they've, they've always been extremely influential people and very from very early on they established their separate identity. Um, it is, um, of course, um, uh, uh, um, a travesty to think that Jains are not Hindu, if there is such a thing as Hindu, that Jains are not Hindu and the Adivasis of India are. Um, that uh, Adivasis of India do not have a caste system, they do not have Sanskrit, they don't do shlokas, there's no Brahminism, yet they are considered increasingly Hindu, whereas Jains are not. A any objective person looking at this would say, this is bunkum. But, but the bunkum is truth now. I mean, this is the reality which we inhabit. The guiding principle uh, of, of the British was to reduce complexity in an enormously complex system. Their primary goal uh, was to reduce variance and to reduce detail. Um, the thousands of gods and languages and communities, it, 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 it was, it was it, I find India uh, uh, jaw-droppingly diverse. I, I, I can't even imagine what it would have appeared to, of, to foreigners, you know, showing up you know, 250 years ago, uh, 300 years ago, um, when actually the differences were even greater. Now there are semi-link languages, like Hindi is sort of a link language of India. It, it didn't it used to be that way. We're talking about, remember the, the, how different the world was. In the very first census of 1872, the largest city in India was, was Calcutta. It had roughly 800,000 people. That's quite a lot. The second city of India was Mumbai with less than 200,000 people. Delhi had less than 150,000 people. The Delhi of Dalrymple um, had less than 150,000 people. The Delhi of today has 30 million people. We're talking about very, very different worlds. But the, it was absolutely essential for the the colonizers, if they were to rule, to simplify this complexity. And for the simplification, they all, we always rely on what we know to understand what we don't, right? These are models. All our heads have models inside them. Um, so they, they use the model of existing Semitic religions, the, the Judeo-Christian sense of. Uh, um, there are people now who argue, scholars now who argue, that to use the very word religion for the faith practices of India is wrong terminology. Because what they had um, could not be classified as religion in the way that Europeans thought of as religion. The trans what is the Hindi translation for the word religion? Dharm. Dharm is not religion. It is not religion at all. Just like Ishwar is not God, Dharam is not religion. These are different, I'm sorry again, epistemological systems. They, they, their words have different sources and different meanings. Um, yet, the powerful ones get to decide what has meaning and what meaning it is. 
they rely on existing texts to understand the deep structure of society. The existing texts, of course, were the Sanskrit texts, which by my calculations, no more than three to four percent of Indians would have, of the time, would have had a chance of even reading, if comprehending, I'm not even talking about comprehension. And the asymmetries of power were used to establish these simplifications as law and custom. Bernard Cohn writes, the conquest of India was a conquest of knowledge. It was a conquest of knowledge systems. It was a way to define the social reality of this very large and complicated subcontinent in ways that would make it manageable and governable. Simple. I call it the first and defining draft of Indian history. We do not have actually a history of India before the British created one for us. I'm going to skip over the middle because I really should be finishing pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Give me 10. I think I can close it to 10. Let, I'll do the best. Um, I, want, I, I promised Ronald Joy uh, 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 that I'll bring it up to the present day because I, I really want to talk about the theoretical framework, right? So what happens to simplification in the age of smartphones? What happens when we move from a situation of absence and asymmetry of information to abundance? We are inundated with information. You open your phone, and there is information in front of your eyes. Right? The Euro-American literature is suggesting three possibilities at this point. Right? And this is pre-Trump and pre-Brexit. This stuff is too recent for it to have been theorized properly yet. Um, there is a populist claim that new communication technologies erode the influence of organized groups and political elites. There is the community building claim that new communication technologies uh, cause a restructuring of the nature of community and the foundations of social order. And an accelerated pluralism claim by somebody whose work I really like, I call Bruce Bimber at, at UC Santa Barbara. Um, that new communication technologies aid the ongoing fragmentation of interest group politics and a shift towards a more fluid issue-based group politics with less institutional coherence. This is pre-Trump and pre-Brexit. Where do you stand now? I'm not going to speak for the rest of the world. I just want to use this theoretical framework to try to understand where we are now. Um, and I see two paths. One is the path of democratization, expression of public will, new forms of political and cultural organization, formation of special interest groups. There are very big positives. Um, the demise of the colonial um, land acquisition law, something I've worked on in detail earlier, I see primarily as a result of the reduction of, of information asymmetry. I'm not going to go into the detail, but primarily as a result of the people who were always marginalized to finally make demands and resist. And that was as a result of being able to communicate with each other, primarily, and to communicate with the public and in the media, <coughs> be on TV and on newspapers. On the negative side, there are translocal organ organization by hate groups. Right? But the key argument I wish to make over here, and it is not a very solid argument in the sense that I'm, I'm, I'm still hoping it's not true, is that in this din, in this age of multiple information sources, in this uh, of 900 TV channels, 400 news channels, multiple websites, um, any and everybody shooting off their mouth, um, Simple information is more relevant, perhaps, than ever before. The rise of the brand or the message, right? Um, finding the signal in the noise, finding, finding the, the, the melody in, in the cacophony. I suspect that um, there is an increasing temptation, um, increasing possibility for the, for the rise of polarization and majoritarianism. And this, I'm talking about theoretical terms, but specifically for India. I, I see that uh, the possibility of the rise of storyteller politicians uh, 
who may not actually be bound by ideology or party. People who are able to communicate directly to the people, either via Twitter or via bhashans <coughs> um, or via yatras or via other means. Um, and I am beginning to suspect and I'm arguing that uh, we have reached a point in which the messenger is the message. Um, there are uh, many colleagues uh, and perhaps people in this room um, uh, who um, think that um, the message of the, the current uh, ruling party uh, uh, in India, the BJP, um, is one that is supported by very large majorities. Um, uh, the electoral numbers don't actually show that. right? Um, the, the BJP share is roughly one third of the electorate. Um, how many of that one third actually supports the party because it is a Hindutva party? I don't know. I don't know that people are asking these questions. But not 100% for sure. There are other reasons to support the BJP. So after this hard sell of the thir 30 years of hard sell, the support for Hindutva is roughly one third. What about the remaining two thirds? The remaining two thirds is splintered, of course. Right? They're diff hearing different messages. Is it possible for the plural message to find to find expression in a single messenger. I believe that is the singular democratic challenge of India right now. Is it possible in an age where simple information is increasingly more powerful, in which the din is louder than ever, when you need to cut through the noise and to provide a clear message, is it possible for pluralism to create a single message? Is it possible, I think, the more relevant question is, is it possible for pluralism to find a single messenger? Because I believe most people do not actually pay attention to the message. Most people do not even comprehend what the message is. They trust the messenger. Like we trust certain movie critics. We trust film directors, we trust actors, we trust writers, we trust academics, we trust people for the quality of the work they do. Most people need people to trust, particularly among their politicians, regardless of what they say or do. So the existential questions remain unresolved, actually. The, the fundamental political question, I believe, more than ever, is, is about the identity of the collective. What is the other against which one defines the self? Um, the other um, were the British, the colonizers, and defining the self was very easy then. We don't have that external other anymore. In the immortal words of Pogo, we have met the enemy and he is us. Right? So the other is internal, is inside. They are uh, minorities or urban naxals or some other form that you can define yourself against. The subject that I have not talked about because it's its ho own whole thing is about the trajectory of justice and the utter failure of expert discourse to actually provide good information on inequality in India. I, it, it is a good chunk of, of my book but it's, it's a separate subject altogether. So I'll, I will end with this sort of, on this sort of sorry note, that if the messenger is indeed the message, the singular problem um, is to find a single messenger for a pluralistic message. Th this is where I am right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shonjo. Uh, we have quite a bit on the table, both in terms of abstract theory and real life examples. Um, so the floor is now open for questions. Dr. Chaudhary always has a question. I have a very broad question. Um, there's a lot of talk about Hindu and Muslim Indian. Um, 
violent, in general, would be, uh, would be applicable, uh, applicable to, I mean, if particular is a paradigm, the general would be applicable to all particulars. So why particularize India? I mean, how do you make this jump from general to India? Would it not be true of any other construct such as India, uh, like Europe or America or any part of uh, our exis existence or, or social system? Uh, uh, why is the general, uh, how do you make this jump to India from your general principles? Uh, uh, do we take the principles one by one? I'd, I'd um, prefer to do that. I don't see any other hand, so okay. why don't you go? Um, yeah. That's a very good question, sir. Um, and actually, um, uh, there are two answers to this. One is, it is a general theory. It, sh it does apply to Russia, it applies to Iran, it applies everywhere in the world, because it is a general theory. Um, it's complicated. There is uh, the sense, um, the, the hierarchy of the world that suggests that uh, we are the receivers of theory, we, meaning people who look like us, are never the givers of theory. So there is that challenge of establishing one's um, intellectual credentials. Um, there is also uh, a desire, um, this is personal, I'm talking about me as a person, of wishing to talk to my people, my community. I don't think this is the end of it. What I've written right now is probably not the end of it. I, it, it has the possibility of getting um, somewhat longer legs and, and I wish at some point to push it further and make it more of a general theory. I, I believe people are grasping for theory right now and explanation. How do you explain Brexit, Trump and Putin and all of this? And this goes a little way towards trying to do that. So thank you. That's, that's, that's a very good question. Okay, I see two hands. Uh, first Rahul and then Diego. Thank you, Dr. Chakraborty, for this presentation. Uh, I have bit, one bit louder. quick question for uh, you mentioned about that print media is actually the m building the nation or developing the nation. Actually, I forgot the term what you used before nation, de developing or uh, building nation. Nationalism, really, yes. Nationalism mm -hmm. or actually creating a, s a mindset de developing among the uh, citizens. Now we are actually in the age of digital era or the TV age, where media has actually changed to a large extent, and they are um, we are getting news or fake news or the news that is coming is uh, shaping the our idea, our thought process, so, and more many of the news are fake news, so-called fake news, and um, in many instances we see that media don't even bother to. Uh, investigate whether it is a good, uh, real news or uh, just they broadcast it and later we understand the news is not in the real news it was a fake news or it was uh, there was nothing real to it, these things so how do you think that it is shaping the mindset or it is uh, influencing the uh, thought process of the citizens um. I wish I could give you a very uh, straightforward answer to that. Um, what I'm going to say might sound a little like a uh, little cartoonish, a little bit of a caricature. Um, I, I think uh, most people consume news like they consume food, uh, which is what is to their taste, right? Um, so what seems like fake news to me uh, may indeed be fake news, assuming there is such a thing as a complete non-fake news. Um, they, it, it's actually questionable whether such a thing exists. Um, but if it is to my taste, right? if it tells me a story of my community beating up on a community I don't like, let's say, my team wins, my people look good, other people look bad. If that is my taste, I consume that news. Um, and there are uh, uh, mediators and providers who know that I will consume that news, will put that news on the table. You and I probably will consume some other news. So there is a market for news. right? 
And it's a finely segmented market now in India. It's in multiple languages hitting. For instance, I've heard from insiders that uh, the, the BGP, for instance, simply doesn't care about what is said in the English language media. It, it doesn't matter to them. You can do as much gali as you like. They will send their Sambit Patras out to outshout people, but they don't, it doesn't really matter because their voters are not English speakers. This, if you, once you treat news not as fact, but as a market commodity and with multiple sources, this is where the question of whom do you trust, how do you find a simple message, how do you actually communicate to large numbers of people in convincing ways? Those are the questions that rise to the surface. And I'm afraid only one political party in India is doing the strategic thinking on this, and others are not. And, and I, I, I don't know how, what others feel about it, but there's a serious level of strategic thinking that is necessary to do right now. Um, knowing full well that there is fake news on the table, and possibly there is no such thing as fake news. News has always been fake. The black hole of Calcutta, was it real news or fake news? At the time that it happened, it was considered news. It was used to mobilize uh, the British spirit and the, 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 the British fighting forces. The current interpretation is it was fake news. The thing simply did not happen. And at worst, what may have happened, instead of 130 or 150 people dying in a sweltering little dank hole in Calcutta, maybe three people did. Maybe nobody did. Is that fake news or not? The Sepoy mutiny. The news circulated that you're biting down on, Hindus were told, on cow fat. The Muslims were told on pig fat. It turns out it was neither. It was vegetable oil, right? Is that fake news or history or truth or what is it? So fake news has always been around. It's how you mobilize and politicize it, how you strategically, strategically think about it, I think that, that matters. Okay. Uh, Diego and then Hi, thanks. A very, very, very stimulating uh, talk. I have a, a three brief quest comments or questions. Uh, the first one is uh, that I think that the key difference with uh, present day information um, in terms of you know, availability on, of information on the smartphone is not so much the fact that they are available on our hand, is that we are reached by information even if we are not looking for them. So if I go on Facebook, maybe I just want to look for funny cats. Uh, but if I scroll down, I, read, I am reached by information. Uh, and that is, I think, the key difference uh, with uh, other form of media. And I was wondering whether this, uh, how this reflects into your uh, theoretical framework. The second uh, comment is that yeah, we trust the messenger. I would say yes and no. Uh, we trust the messenger, but I think we trust the messenger now, nowadays if we like the message that the messenger is telling us. So um, I had the dubious um, privilege of being in Britain during the UK uh, debate of, on Brexit. And uh, that was exactly the opposite. I mean, we don't trust traditional forms of uh, authority anymore, but we trust an anonymous message received on WhatsApp based on nothing or on inexisting research because we like to, you know, we like the simple idea that we have. So I think y you, y you are right, but uh, I'm not sure whether we trust the messenger or the message. And, and, and what's the direction of causality, if you like. Uh, and the third uh, uh, brief comment is, uh, when you, uh, po uh, when you uh, presented your two existential questions, um, I think, well, it, it made me think of the concept of social consciousness uh, as uh, you know, empathy for our fellow citizens, which is, is something that, every time I visit India, is something that strikes me by the lack of social consciousness in India, the tolerance for uh, blood and injustices. Um, and there, are, there is some comparative work that shows that this kind of social consciousness is much lower in India than in other countries. So uh, I thought, I, I was wondering if you had thought about this. That's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, le let me give you some stream of consciousness stuff in response. Um, I'm not on social media. Um, I do know what, what you speak of. Um, which is one of the reasons I'm not on social media. Because I wish 
to choose the news I will consume, Thank not you, what sir. somebody else sends me and tells me is news. Um, you are pursued by news and information all the time. I, I completely agree. How that fits into this larger framework, I haven't given it a lot of thought. The framing this, I won't say it was hard enough, but it's challenging enough to communicate this. Getting into the trenches of Facebook, um, maybe at a, at a later point, I haven't really gotten to that point. Whether it's the messenger or the, or the message is a very important question. Right? I believe it has always been the messenger. I believe that whether we talk about Kabir or Chaitanya or Muhammad or any spiritual leader from the past, most of them did not say things that others were not saying. But they led exemplary lives of certain sort, inspiring lives of certain. They were charismatic figures. I have actually followed the uh, personality of Chaitanya, he's a Hindu reformer, um, Vaishnav uh, in uh, 16th century Bengal. I, I've learned a lot about him. And I'm firmly convinced um, that his personality was magnetic. He was a very good looking fellow. He was thin and fair with a lovely singing voice and a great dancer. And, and he used to mesmerize audiences. He was not selling anything new. He was selling bhakti. He was selling Krishna love. It, it was him, not his message. I think over and over again you're going to find the same thing to be true. That it is the messenger through some charismatic life circumstance, some combination of figures that is able to cut through a lot of cynicism. We are cynical. Most people are mostly cynical about most people's motives. Right? For some people, we set our cynicism aside. What they say is what we believe. It is not necessary that they say something that is different from what other, others are saying. But because they say it, we believe it. I'm, I'm sort of pretty firmly convinced of this. But I'm not so convinced that I'll you know, dig this to my grave. Uh, I'm, I, there's a lot to think about on this one. I've forgotten your third question. OK, we have a vision. Thanks, Manu. Fascinating talk. Uh, Nice to be reminded back of the of the Cassie days at, at Penn at some level. But so two or three things that I wanted to sort of probe a little more. One, if I understand correctly, your underlying premise in some sense is this idea of simple information, right? Is that a new concept? Was information actually consumed? Was more complex information consumed? en masse ever or was it always that it was complex forms of you know sort of pluralistic messages complicated you know without simple conclusions that was maybe part of the discourse but the message that would or the information that would sort of in some sense stream down to regular people in their everyday lives was always simple Right, so it's not so, it, and so I'm, I'm just sort of wondering whether you know, sort of this idea of a simple, which 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 I think is fascinating, and I, and I totally I think get what you're getting at. I'm just wondering whether that's necessarily a new thing, or whether that sort of ties into this idea that now, actually, many more people can consume information. That is the new thing. right. So it's simple inform. It was always simple information, but now we are all consuming it. It was always the message. So that's the other thing that I wanted to so w and this idea that you mentioned about credibility, right? And sort of you, you, you take the example of, you know, Doordarshan or, you know, DD1 and DD Metro and then, you know, now f uh, multiple news channels. Mm -hmm. How is it that then a news, uh, who then has credibility in that framework? Everybody and what has less. Everybody has But you see, that's the thing. So if everybody has less credibility, how is it that we identify some channels or print media or you know uh, websites now with a particular form of uh, you know having taken a particular side in some sense in the debate 
right? If everybody is less credible, then how do how does the individual believe that one of them is actually more credible? Is it because of the content of the message, or is it about the individuals who we see on television or who we see in terms of the bylines? Why, why do, for example, right, to take a real example, why does NDTV, for example, get a bad rap universally, right? They're considered sort of anti-BJP government. But if they're, if they're not credible, then surely the fact that they're not anti, the, 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 the idea that they're anti-BJP is also up for questioning, right? But why is that, for example, considered <coughs> a universal truth now? Or that Republic TV, on the other hand, has an agenda that has aligned itself completely with right, Amit Shah or, or uh, the government, correct? So where does that credibility then come from? Why, why does somebody believe Republic TV and not believe Very good questions. Um, <coughs> <coughs> what I'm um, putting on the table is not new as a phenomenon, but new as an explanation. And I believe it is a completely believable explanation, which is why people think it's an old explanation. Okay. Uh, my sense is, you know, I, a few people have read the, the manuscript and, and they buy it. Why do they buy it? Well, first of all, they know me, they trust me, but also because what I'm telling them, they already sort of knew. Nobody just told them. So, yes, the simple message has always been the preferred message. There was a lot less messaging before, a lot less information. People led very isolated lives. Right? Um, most people spent, even up to the 18th century, spent in India, spent their entire lives, had never traveled more than 20 miles from the place of birth. Never. Um, the news or information that they got was often years old. Um, you know, like the Japanese soldiers who were caught finding Second World War 30 years after the war was over. Um, what has changed is not the importance of simple information, but the torrent of information that is now available. Right? Our minds have not changed genetically in structure. What has changed is what our brains have to now deal with. The content of our brains is changing. Right? A lot of stuff is being written into it. Which do we choose to trust and believe and keep? That's your second question, right? And I wish I knew the answer to that, because that takes us to another level of questioning, which I'm not able to go to. Is my instinct says, just looking at me, the only person I can look at seriously is myself. I can't look at inside anybody else. Um, that these are preferences. And they sort of predate almost consciousness. So I've been a leftist from the day I have thought of myself as a person. Why? There's just no explanation that I can see inside my head. I grew up in a pretty well to go household. By that, you know, the genealogical line, I should not have been. I should have protected what I would have been my interest. Many of us in this room have been instinctive leftists without really knowing why. Why does one prefer the color red over the color, color black? There's no explanation for it. It's just there. Now, this is me talking simply about a question to whose, whose answer I do not know. It is a question that I don't think we've actually asked ourselves that seriously yet. I, I, uh, I'm not well read in philosophy. I'm, and there are people in the room who are, and perhaps they can help me with this. Uh, where do preferences come from? Deep preferences. Not trivial preference, but deep preferences. Where do they come from? Um, there's also. 
nobody I know who's working on India um, who's even asking this sort of question. Why do you like Republic TV and not NDTV and vice versa? I don't even know how many people watch those channels. I would not, I would say they're not in the very large numbers. Um, I'm going to keep really um, an agnostic's position on this. In saying, I, I honestly don't. I wish I did, but I don't. I don't know where preferences come from. In economics, they're treated as given. Preferences are given. Right, Omidandu? OK. Um, I think we'll just take a last round of questions since we are running out of time. So I see Omitendu. Uh, Robin, did you have a question? Uh, no. Oh, okay, that's fine. Yeah. So I'm just trying to, you know, uh, I don't know if I'll sound nice, but I'm just trying to uh, come to this basic clarification. W what do you mean? I mean, when you put this framework up ahead, what do you imply by information? Look, let me explain where I'm trying to come from. And again, I'm contextualizing this in the context of India. India constitutionally provides the right to people to know. Right? And it was a fundamental right. Till 1974, when the Supreme Court said that the right to know is fundamental. Now, the point is that at that stage, the right to know was as brought up forward till 2005 when the RTI came up. It was taken as a situation where the citizens must have a right to know what the government is up to. And certain information should be disclosed to them. It's a fundamental right to have. Now, this is where I think we, we need to make a distinction between what do we mean by information? Are we talking about facts? You see, when you gave the example of size of Muslim families, if I say, if I, if I just send out a message saying that Muslims have larger families than Hindus in India, it's a perception, it's a view. If I send out a message saying that 65% of Muslim families in the household such and such have larger family sizes than comparable Hindus and others, that's a fact. Now, that fact can be contested. That's where I need to go back to the source. But the point that I'm trying to raise is that when I come across a perception, as I mentioned in my first example, why should I take it as an information? It's just a perception. And there is a forum for perception. Perception is a totally individual account to be looked at, to be reacted to. I think one of the things that we, we, we should keep in mind in this entire discourse is that who are we addressing at the end of the day? It's, it's the consumer of information. And if information is eventually distilled into perception, opinion, facts, impressions, whatever, then I think at each level, the ability of the individual to actually react to it becomes important. Because in a number of cases, I think it's not a question of fake or non-fake. You know, like surgical strikes on Pakistan by India, fake or non-fake. Uh, I think the bigger issue is that this is a fact which has been put out. And if that fact is to be challenged, the fact has to be challenged like the way a fact has to be challenged. One can debate the perception, you know, whether there was a surgical strike, this, that. That's a different matter. But if facts are provided by the, see, even today, when we talk about the population of India, we might disagree that whether it's up by 500 million or less by 600 billion. But if there is a number put out in the public domain by a source agency, we have to accept it as fact and that is information, a category of information. So what I'm trying to arrive at is that when you provide this framework to us, which is very, very invigorating in the sense 
that you bring it together, you bring in the history, you bring in the you know, larger sort of contextual background to it. I'm just a little bit confused about what exactly you mean by information. Because when you say that people are being flooded with information, I'm not exactly sure if people are being flooded with facts. No, they are not. Oh. So in that case, I mean, how do we distinguish? Sorry, well, maybe the little uh, long drawn out. Uh, mm. Do we have any other questions? We'll just take uh, all the questions together. Iqbal and I might slip in one. Yeah, no, Iqbal, well, but, you. Ronald, if you don't mind. I, we're I, running out of time. One, but one on one. Let's just give Then I think we're out of quick, time. Quickly. Then this is the last. I can ask okay. a question over these. So no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, this is the one slide I actually skipped over. Um, What we, what we are talking about is, is the left-hand side, the expert perspective. This is a, this is a well-known device, actually. The, the Data Information Knowledge Wisdom Pyramid, right? so D-I-K-Y. There, there are different forms of this, but it's called, considered a pyramidal structure of you know, numbers and facts being collapsed into categories and connections, higher-level thinking into theories and models, and then ultimately philosophies and truths. My perspective is on the other side, which is, sure, this is expert discourse. Right? These are, this is you and I talking to each other. Right? We question, if there is a surgical strike, you want to do a surgical strike, give us. Right? The cow that did actually a surgical strike, Wata, because we, we prefer we celebrate it in our schools. Win. <laughs> this is such a good story. Um, but this. Simple information perspective, everything is information. Gossip is the most important form of information. Did you hear that such and such did such and such? I mean, the, 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 the office grapevine, the water cooler conversation, everything is information in this perspective. You may disagree, but, and, but I see that the, I, even the most rational of us, me included, are as dependent on gossip, rumor, innuendo, circulation, prejudices as I am on numbers, facts, theories, models, explanations, and, and all of that. Um, we always simultaneously inhabit both worlds, this is my view. Look, we have a couple of minutes, so Iqbal, we'll ask the questions if we have time for the answer. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll, I'll just take it. The slow thinking part of my brain takes very long to kick in, so it hasn't kicked in yet. Um, just coming back to the earlier portion of your your, the, your talk um, about is the real issue you're dealing with actually institutionalization of certain categories of information rather than just information itself. The reason I ask that is when when you look at the colonial period and the, the recasting of, of caste groups, or religious communities, etc., it's not a case where the colonial officials hmm. have no knowledge or, or rather that there is no knowledge, information circulating around. There, there, there are networks of information. There are Mughal census reports. There are Mughal attempts to characterize as well. The issue is they're not interested in those, those forms of information. They are interested in certain questions. They're in, interested in the question of religion, for instance, which is something that the Mughal caste, caste sorry, the Mughal census reports do not ask. N neither do the British ask of themselves. Precisely. They Precisely. ask only of Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. And so and then what you have then is this institutionalized and now we're dealing with these categories as information. That's important. And then this is where the state structure kicks in, right? The modern state structure has a form of institutionalizing, which right. the pre modern state didn't have. Right. And so this is what I mean by are we actually dealing with the institutionalization of certain forms of information? I, 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 I could I, I just I, add a last question sure. since I think we're up. Right. Yeah, just uh, on the question of caste, it might be a, a stereotype or a caricature to say actually the British simplified the caste system. I think they were well aware of many of them, of the complexities of the caste system. They used it, you know, of course we have people like Nicholas Dirks, you know, Bernard Cohn himself, you know, invention, creation of caste. So I think people have argued that before. But the caste system, as it is, you know, as it carried over to the to independent India and what we see now, in fact, is far more complex than maybe you know, you know, what you were describing as the the fourfold you know, one uh, system. In fact, the Indian state has made it you know, remarkably complicated for its own set of purposes. So, 
it, and I have sort of a different take from maybe yours on the caste system. Uh, uh, the related questions. Let, 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 me, let me try to deal with them. Um, very good questions also. Um, I am beginning from the institutionalization, yes. So I'm beginning from the British period. Because I don't think there's an India before that. Right? So th this Mughal India, sure, they're, they're trying some censuses. Uh, turns out widely kind of off the mark, or so the British say. Um, but they, are they acting on those? Uh, not a lot, other than to collect land revenue. Their primary purpose is to collect land revenue. So I'm starting from the idea of India forming, right? The British creating this map saying our territory, our rules, right? Our institutions. That is where I'm beginning, that this is when they're collecting information, they're creating categories, they're assigning people roles, properties, etc. cetera. Um, and I'm taking it to the current period where there is kind of a disappearance of the institution in many ways, right? Because these non-state institutions are now pumping in a lot of energy into the political system. And the state begins to retreat so much so, after 80 years, it does a caste census and doesn't have the balls to put it out, right? And they never will. It, it, we are never going to see those numbers. So I'm trying to cover that, that, that arc of that, that experience. The caste question, of course, is, is central. It is central in India right now. It's a very difficult question um, as to what it was before and what it is now after the institutionalization and the demarcations and categories and, 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 and the different uh, rewards, awards, uh, uh, systems that are assigned to categories. It has a life of its own. The question that I do not, that puzzles me the most, is I have a sense of what this life is, the current one. What was caste in India like in 1750 or 1650? I am actually, and I would love some help from this room, I'm knocking my head against all the walls there are to find a non-Sanskrit version. One, even one will do of caste in India circa 1750. I have not found one so far. So the only versions that are out there are Sanskrit versions. And if you assume, like I do, if you believe that they are Brahman fantasies, they're not reality, then what was the truth of caste? Was it, how oppressive was it? How oppressive was it in Andhra versus Bengal versus Punjab versus Tamil Nadu? Which caste were dominating where? I actually don't think we know the answers to those questions. Um, and I actually take many um, principled um, caste uh, 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 activists to task, saying, you, you, you project from uh, samskara, um, the, the, the novel. Uh, most people must have read um, Anantamurthy's set in 1930s uh, Karnataka. And you project that backwards 200 years, and it simply doesn't work for me. You cannot actually project that backwards 200 years. To Karnataka, certainly, you certainly cannot project it to the rest of India. I am afraid we actually do not know what the nature of the caste system was, what caste was in 1750 India. Forget about 1500 India. There are almost no non-Sanskrit sources. What Nicholas Dirk says over and over again is, I looked and nobody talks about caste. Where did the British see so much caste? Because when I looked at the archives of these southern kings, I looked at the collection of this guy, Carpenter, what's the archive he looked at? There is no caste in these archives. Where did it come from? I, I, I am over there with, with, with Dirk's actually. Where did it come from? Who brought it up? What was it like? I don't know. Okay. On that note, uh, we have <laughs> plenty of food for thought. Uh, it's my pleasant duty to thank uh, Professor Shonja Chakraborty and hand him a, a token of our appreciation. Thank you. I have an essay.